but so uh, yeah, it would be worth it for us. So thanks. Oh, okay. Um, and since since we told people that we would, um, we just stop. I'll come up front. Am I on TV? <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here. This is so great to see everyone. Uh, we are fortunate to have a scholar from Australia. Uh, you'll love the accent because it makes everything sound so much smarter. And uh, this is Joe Kading. I'm not doing what I call the full Clara. Dr. Chu used to read everybody's pedigree, uh, a very formal introduction. But I'm going to let Joe give you the Don't introduction because it's all it's all connected to what she's doing and how she got to where she is. So I'm just going to turn it over to Joe. And um, she has said that if you have a question while she's talking, go ahead and ask it rather than waiting, because I always forget my question by the end, or I, you've already answered it or something. So I'm just going to turn it over uh, to Joe. And welcome. And this is Joe's uh, daughter, Claire, who's a marvelous and wonderful a uh, young woman that I've been enjoying. So uh, say hi to Claire. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. All right. Well, thank you. Um, before I start, it would be um, useful and interesting for me to know how many of you may be um, currently working within a library. So I know how many practitioners. Okay, beautiful. All right. How many of you are students within this area? Okay, lovely. And then are the rest faculty, is that right? Okay. Is there anyone who's just hanging out? <laughs> All right. Okay, well, um, my name is Jo Kading and I'm a PhD student from the University of South Australia. I'm also a teacher librarian, but for the last 10 years I've been working in a public library as a children's librarian. So I'm a team leader um, for all of our children's programs. I work at what's called the Adelaide Hills Council Library. Um, and it, it, I, I, love the, I love the opportunity to be a research practitioner. Um, and I think there's a lot going for people who um, are interested and able to do that. Um, before I start, um, if you do want to ask me a question, um, just try and indicate because I, I'll probably keep talking and not focus very well. So give me a, a very clear indication, that would be great. Um, if you do have a question and you prefer not to ask today or you think about it later, um, I've got my blog on the screen and you can also um, get in contact with Julie or she might uh, hand out my email address as well. Um, and okay, so I'll just give you a tiny, tiny bit of information about how I got to this topic. So my topic is access and inclusion for children with special needs and their families in public libraries. My um, passion and interest for this uh, came firstly because I was involved in early intervention literacy in schools and then obviously as a children's librarian in early literacy. Um, 14 years ago, I had a special needs child myself and at that point um, was very, very keen to immerse her in literacy. So for those of you who have an early literacy background, you will know that that level of immersion is critical in those early years to helping children develop literacy. So I was trying to take her to story time in my local public library. And I was finding that incredibly difficult because um, she had a lot of equipment that needed to come with her and there wasn't always space in the programs area for that. Um, and as well as that, she was non-verbal and it, there were no opportunities for her to interact and be involved offered. Um, even, so there were no alternate ways for her to do that. And I think in particular, what really um, instilled it for me was uh, one time my daughter was actually admonished by the presenter because um, unlike the other children who were able to um, ask and, and talk to the presenter, her form of uh, getting attention was tapping 
the person and um, they were not happy with that, despite the fact that she actually had a tracheostomy. So in fact, her disability at that time was quite visible. Anyway, okay. Um, and so that led me on this enormous path, which I'm not, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my research findings now. Okay, so what I'd like to do is set for you um, a little bit of a, a context, a story. So this story is what I'm calling Hannah's story. It's a real story, but um, for confidentiality reasons, um, that's not the child's name. So Hannah is a young girl with cerebral palsy. She is very engaging and bright. She has limited physical movement and also limited language. Hannah loves books and it's a priority for Hannah's mum that Hannah becomes literate. And the direct quote that um, her mum gave to me was she said, an education is the only way Hannah will be respected in our society. So for Hannah's mum, it's absolutely critical that Hannah is given those opportunities to become literate. Um, like a lot of families who have children with uh, disabilities, there are a lot of financial constraints on that family. So money for books is limited in their environment. Hannah, um, when she visits the library with her mum and she has two older sisters as well, is unable to uh, self-select her own books. So she's unable to actually reach um, those books, so she's reliant upon her mum to choose books for her, which um, obviously as she gets older will have a greater impact. Um, she's unable to participate in the children's programs. There's limited space for her wheelchair, and those of you who are public librarians will know how busy children's programs get. Um, and, but more than, more than the fact that there's limited space, Hannah actually wants to be on the floor with the other kids. She doesn't want to be sitting in a wheelchair at the back. She wants to be on the floor in amongst all the other children, but there are, there's no supported seating available at the library that she goes to. So that might be the form of bean bags. It might be the form of what sometimes are called bumbos. So they're a little bit of a harder plastic supported seating. On top of that, the pace of the activities are too fast for her and the craft activities are just not um, suitable for her. On top of all of that, if that's not enough, it takes 20 minutes to get Hannah out of the car using the lifting equipment and then also obviously 20 minutes to get her back in the car. So that's a real time commitment that her family are making. And if you consider, and I'm sure you have it here, I think with your snow in particular, trying to do that in extreme weather conditions would be really unpleasant. As a result of all of this, Hannah and her family do not visit the library as often as they'd like to. And it means that the two older sisters actually miss out on a lot of the children's programs. Um, there is a home delivery service in Hannah's community, but it's simply not regular enough to meet the literacy needs of a whole family. Okay. So I think that gives you a little bit of the context for what we might be looking at. Okay, in terms of how big a problem this is, um, you can see some of the statistics for disability rates. So for children in Australia, 13% of under 14 year olds. In the US, that's um, listed as being 8%. However, I did find that the US government Center for Disease Control and Prevention had actually found that 16% of children in the US had a developmental disability. What I'm trying to illustrate by showing you that is that there is discrepancy in those rates. So we can't necessarily take that rate as being accurate. And part of that reason is due to the fact that um, disabilities and special needs for children are often diagnosed at a later date. So if you're not um, if you're not born with a very obvious um, physical disability, then it can take some time for a diagnosis to come into play, and some time also for families to um, to accept 
that their child may have um, something a little bit different. So I guess um, one of the key things from that is that whilst we're not sure exactly of the level of um, percentage of um, people with disabilities, what we do know is that people with a disability are the largest minority group in the world. So it's not any number of other um, diversity areas which are also really important, but we know that disability is actually the largest. And within that, 90% of the disabilities are invisible. So quite often you might hear people say, oh, we don't have people with disabilities coming to my library. Really, you know that? 90% are invisible. So for every one person you see with a disability, obviously there are another nine that you haven't spotted. Okay, so just it's just an awareness that you can't always tell who does or does not have a disability. Um, the most common disability for children is invisible and um, it's an intellectual disability. So within that, we've got um, autism, Down syndrome, ADHD, and other, other forms of intellectual disability. So that's the largest, and it, um, like I said, it's very hard to spot. Okay, so why should libraries be accessible for a minority group? Um, it's the law, basically, that's, in, in a way, that's what it comes down to. Plus, it's also a very core principle of um, public libraries. So in America, you've got the Disability Act of 1990, um, and most, most Western nations have um, a very similar a very similar act. So that's that there. Um, and you can see in that act, it talks about um, state and local government um, entities, the public entities. Well, that's what the public library is, obviously. So that's where the public library fits in there. Okay. Um, as well as that, you've got organisations like UNICEF, and um, this is from their Convention of the Rights of the Person with a Disability. And if you look at that very clearly, it talks about things like participate and enjoy. So what they're referring to are the aspects of inclusion. So access is not simply being able to get in the door, which at some places can actually be a huge thing anyway, but just being able to get into a building doesn't mean that the rest of it is accessible for you. Doesn't mean that services and other things are accessible for you. So you can see quite clearly here that UNICEF are referring also to um, inclusion. And if you have a look at that, you can also see they specifically talk about libraries again as well. The reason I'm showing you this is because this information can be very useful if you're trying to put together a, um, a case for getting funding to do something in your library. So these are the sorts of things that you might be wanting to pull out. Um, in here, we've got the American Library Association um, very clearly in here referred to um, the role of library and in including people with disabilities in planning and implementing and evaluating services as well. So again, this is a really useful quote if you're trying to get a, put a proposal together. But it, it reinforces that importance of the role. Um, the Library Association has a similar one. Um, the UK have something, Singapore have something. So you'll find this sort of all around the world. Okay. Now, in 2014, I um, undertook a research trip on this topic to the United States and Canada. I was fortunate enough to secure three um, grants to undertake this research. And on that tour, I visited 22 public libraries and those are the cities that I visited. And 18 public librarians um, took part in both a one-on-one -on -one interview and um, an online survey, which we did together. So we sat together and did that. Okay, so here are some of the results of that. So um, participants were asked what they thought the greatest benefit of access and inclusion um, for the family, for the library, and for the community 
was going to be. And what's really fascinating about this is that there's a huge amount of consensus. So 83% of people of um, public librarians um, found or felt that being connected. And then you've got 77% and again, 83%. So that tells you that these are some really important benefits that public librarians who have experience are seeing. And so what I mean is uh, have experience within um, this area so they do actually run programs and focus on this. Okay, um, they were also asked, what do you see as the main barriers to um, access for children with special needs and their families? Again, you can see a fairly even spread in those results, but what's fascinating um, is that the number one is library staff attitudes and sensitivities. So bearing in mind, these results came from public librarians who have experience in providing access and inclusion. So for them, they felt that within um, their libraries, that one of the biggest um, barriers was library attitudes and sensitivities. This can be a little bit confronting as a professional um, because you sort of think, well, hold on, everybody I know is really lovely. That can't be the case. Um, but as I, I mentioned last night as well, a lot of that I think is due to a lack of knowledge in this area. So um, if you are not aware of and you don't have knowledge in this area, it's, it's a lot easier to be insensitive. Um, and a really, I think a really classic example would be the use of first person language. Now, do many of you, have you heard of that before? A few of you had. Um, essentially, that is where you refer to the person before you mention their disability. So it would be um, the child with um, a hearing impairment, the child with autism. You would not say the autistic child. But if you haven't had any of that kind of training, it's quite easy how to, you can see how it's easy to be insensitive about that. Okay. Oh, and the other really interesting I found about this is that technology was not mentioned as a barrier. Yet in all of the um, literature review I'd done pre prior to that, um, the research has been in the area of technology. So. Where, where, how is technology going to solve this issue and whatever? Well, it wasn't even listed as a barrier. So that's something to consider. Okay, um, the, they were asked, what do you think prevents libraries from addressing barriers to access? Um, and you can see the results there. This first um, result in terms of lack of knowledge, 77%, I think links really nicely back to that 55% of staff attitudes and sensitivity. So it's like I said, if you haven't got the, if you haven't got knowledge, it's easy. Um, you can see how you can have that. What was interesting for me is that nobody explicitly mentioned management as a barrier to um, libraries being an inclusive um, and. For me, that's interesting because, and I'll talk about it a little bit further on, but if you don't have a supportive management, it's really, really difficult to make changes um, within your library. Um, oh, yes, okay, all right, next one. Um, so this question was referred to, what has your library done? And um, participants were actually able to choose everything they had done and then, each of these um, survey questions, there was also an open-ended opportunity for them to discuss other things. If you have a look at that again, you can see how close those results were. So 94% had implemented um, programs, developed partnerships, and 88% had done staff training. So there's some, some really interesting results for the level of consensus there. Again, despite technology being the focus in the research, it was it was not in the top 
results for what libraries had done to improve access. Okay, now um, participants were also asked if you could do one thing that would improve access or if you could recommend to another library one thing they could start with, um, what would it be? And you can see here, so the very first thing they've talked about is disability awareness training for all staff. And so I, can, I think you can clearly see a little bit of a, um, a discourse running through there, which is talking about knowledge and training and understanding. Um, you've got outreach programs and and interestingly, number three is priority for management. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I, I need to go in and have a good look and see where that comes out there. Um, what for me is fascinating is that um, in many ways, training is quite an easy barrier to to address as as a um, in a public library for staff. So I'm wondering why it is that public libraries are not making something like disability awareness training as part of their induction programs, for example. Okay, from all of that. Um, information with those um, 18 participants, I pulled together six common or seven common elements um, and I've used those to create what I'm calling an inclusive library model. So that's a picture of that. Bear in mind, I'm still um, in the analysis stage of my research. So at the, at the end, this may change a little bit, but at the moment it's working beautifully and I haven't had anyone come up to me and say, are you crazy? Have you not got it? What are you thinking about that? Um, so I'm going to go through each one briefly for you. So at the base of that model we had, oh, did anyone want to take, were you taking a picture of that? No, okay, that's fine. Um, at the base of that, you've got a supportive management. What I found was that the majority of libraries that had a focus in this area also had a disability access and inclusion plan. What I think is that that plan gives one public libraries a way of um, of planning and, and focusing what they're going to do in the area. And it also gives um, staff an opportunity to say, I think we need to implement this and let's have a look at our disability access and inclusion plan and see how it links in. So you've got that kind of level of, um, I guess, support in, in being able to, to bring about change. Training. Um, the public librarian spoke about disability awareness training, universal design for learning. Now, again, is that a concept that most people are aware of? No? Okay. So, universal design of learning comes from education and it's based on the premise that you're trying to provide a flexible learning environment which will allow as many people to access it. So you're using multiple different approaches or multimodal approaches. So you will, you'll be using things like, um, you know, puppets and um, sign, you might do a bit of keyword signing. So just a, as many different approaches of delivering a program. Um, and what we what they find, particularly universal design, this is the, the whole reasoning behind it, is that quite often what works for one child also works beautifully for a whole range of children. So a good example is in my programs, I use a picture schedule. Um, and in that picture schedule, it will have a picture of, okay, we're going to start with a song and then we're going to have a book and then we're going to have something else. And by having that, I can ask a child to take off each one as we're going. So children who need routine can see, okay, this is what we're up to. This is what we're doing now. So it it benefits a whole range of children, not just children who may be um, on, may have difficulties with autism or something like that. Um, you've got multiple intelligences, and I've got a little picture up there which indicates what that is. But that's that ties in 
as well with the universal design of learning. Um, and then you've got universal design of building or architecture. And a really classic, classic example of that is the curb cutouts that you have in footpaths. They were originally put in um, for people with wheelchairs to be able to cross and whatever. Everybody uses those, people with strollers, people with sore backs, everybody use people on bikes. So that's the sort of universal design where it may work for one um, part of the community, but it actually crosses all areas. Okay, partnerships. If you recall, 94% of the libraries who have a focus in this area also have partnerships. Um, so developing partnerships with external organisations and a really wonderful, wonderful example I found was at the Brooklyn Public Library and they have a partnership with their disability council in their borough. Borough? Borough? Um, we don't have those, that's where rabbits hang out. So I don't really know. <laughs> um, and this council represents their whole area and on the council are the transport authorities, social services, um, government departments, health services, education. So it's it's everybody within that area that has something to do with um, providing services for people with um, disabilities. The public library are on that. Now when they first joined it apparently there was a little bit of a oh oh that's interesting the library are joining our council but pretty soon it became really clear that the public library provided um, amazing avenues for that council to make connections with the community as well. So by partnering, they now run a lot of informational sessions at the public library. Um, the public library are able to feed back to the council what their community are having difficulty with. Um, so, and it also enables um, the public library to really stay abreast of what's happening in the area of that. Plus, you've got that opportunity to market directly to um, your audiences. Okay, programs. The really key thing here is it's not what you deliver, deliver it. And the key thing is to be prepared beforehand, not having to suddenly plan for a person or a child with a special need once they've turned up. So make your programs as flexible as they can be, make them as adaptable as they can be. Um, and some of the wonderful programs I saw were um, Lego and craft. And one of the ones I love, I love is gardening. This one is my favourite and I wish at my own library and I keep telling them if they don't give it to me I'm actually going to rip up the bitumen myself but I, I love children's gardens in public libraries and I love them for children with special needs because it gives that child an opportunity to go and just have some time out. It gives them an opportunity to run off maybe a little bit of crazy energy that they might be experiencing it gives them that opportunity to be with nature and the and the wonderful benefits of being in nature. So if you can have a children's garden, have it connected to your children's area but enclosed so you know that those children are not going to run off and be run, you know, knocked over by a car. Um, and then you can run really wonderful um, sensory programs within that garden as well. It also gives those children an opportunity to be to be next to what you might want to call typical children in in a play environment and you know that's what we're trying to do is provide that level of inclusivity oh that's an example of um, a picture schedule that i spoke with you about um, and the other one which is on the side there is um an a, an art an inclusive art um library that I went to and um, to make the paint brushes larger they just simply uh, got some cardboard and wrapped it around it so what they said is that what they were trying to show to me was that you don't need to spend a fortune on adaptive equipment you just need to have an adaptive mind and think how are we going to do this 
Um, one big thing which came out of this for me was that there's quite a bit of um, disagreement, I guess, discourse you might want to call it, between um, public librarians that run targeted programs for children with special needs and those that run inclusive programs which are for everybody. Um, personally, I believe that targeted programs offer you an opportunity to create a bridge to inclusive mainstream programs. So um, in my own library, I have done that. So I've run a targeted um, sensory story time. And what I found was before running those programs, I had not met any of those families before. They came to my program, suddenly they were in the library all the time <laughs> because they just needed that opportunity to be welcomed into the library, to feel safe in the library. And then they made those transitions themselves, um, which is wonderful. And, and that's what we're working towards. Okay, collections. Again, this is a really big area that you can work in. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm, I love in this area. One is um, the use of audio books. I think a lot of people do not necessarily understand the value of audio books for people who have learning difficulties. They are huge. They can be absolutely huge and they are still a form of reading. And a really classic example I'll give you is actually my own child who took a long time to start reading, but she um, was using audiobooks from birth, basically. Um, but when she was in year two at school, that was a year that all of the children in her class were reading the fairy stories. So you probably have them here where you know, all of the little girls were reading the series of the fairy stories. And that meant that their play in the playground was all about all being a different fairy character in this book. Now, because we had those books on audiobook and my daughter had listened to all of those, it didn't matter that she wasn't able to read the book. She was still able to engage in the play because she knew the characters and she knew how they played. So I think sometimes it you know I, I i certainly didn't intend for her thinking that this will be her you know door to social play but that's what happened and so it's amazing what those things can do um the other thing i really want to highlight here is having books within your collection that are interfiled and they have characters in the book who may have a disability but that's not the focus of the book so you're looking for that sort of diversity of characters within a book they're not always easy to find there's not a, necessarily a lot of them written but but really have a go at it okay and then we've got other books with tactile pictures and sign language oh the other thing I don't know if it was on that other page, really important as well, is when you have um, what's called a high-low collection, most of you are aware of high-low collections, don't put the Easy Reads baby label on it. Nobody wants to be reminded that they have a learning difficulty. Interfile them um, and if you need to put a little discrete sticker somehow on that or keyword so you can do a, um, a, a search something like that but don't interfile them i mean sorry don't make them a separate collection because that's really making those people feel quite quite obviously different um physical environment again it's not just wheelchair access so we're talking about lighting noise furnishing smells spaces making sure you've got um small little nooks that um, provide a quiet little space for a child who is having difficulty coping in that environment can retreat to, get themselves back together and then join the group. Um, so what I would suggest is that you undertake a library access order and benchmark it against the principles of universal design. And if you look that up, you'll find what those are. And then no doubt in your um, communities, you've got, you, you would have um, a building access um, codes as well. You would, I'm sure. 
Okay, marketing. This is an area that um, is also, I believe, really important. Um, when I was talking with the public librarians that have a focus in this area, they didn't particularly highlight marketing for me. But when I spoke with the librarians that do not have a focus in this area, the issue of marketing became really, really clear for me. And, and um, the reason for that was that the libraries where they they didn't have a particular focus in this area, the general belief and consensus was, we're all really nice people. Those families will know they're welcome in our library. And my response was, well, how? How are they going to know that? And at that point, they would say to me, oh my gosh, now you've given me a whole lot to think about, thank you. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it's really just that awareness that just because you know it, doesn't mean anybody else knows it. And I, I gave this example last night, but um, one of the parents that I spoke with in my research said, if the library wanted us to come, wouldn't they put a flyer in the newsletter of my son's school, which was a school um, specifically for children with um, special needs. And it was actually just about right next to the library. So her point was, Basically, wouldn't, wouldn't the library tell us if they actually wanted us to be there? And we do have to tell them because families of children with special needs do not assume that they're welcome. And part of the reason they don't assume they're welcome is because they spend their whole life fighting to get into mainstream school or to get into mainstream gymnastics class or to, to get into these things. And I say to people, Families of children with special needs do not have, so they might, they spend their day fighting with the school system, they spend their day fighting with the healthcare system and the, and the nurses and the doctors and the therapists. The library is not on their list of people to fight with. So they're not going to put themselves in a position where they might, where they feel that they might have to do that. Okay. Oh. Okay, I think I've put a slide in here, I hadn't. that's all right. So, um, this image here is um, an image of a report from that first phase of the study that I've just spoken with you about. That report was written for my funding bodies who were um, all uh, library professional bodies. Um, so it has quite a practitioner focus. So if you're interested, pop onto my blog um, and at, you can access that report. And it, it, it's like, <coughs> I don't know, 50 pages long or something. So there's quite a lot in there. I Skip through bits. You've already, it's just too good, just but already organized. Could you talk about your funding? Because you talked about it last Do night. Do you want me to talk about could it again? Could you just tell all of, I think it's important okay. to show what support you have. Okay, this. so um, so first of all, I was saying, I, um, I ran the particular program in my own library. So when I finally, I think I said, when I got into working in a public library after my daughter had grown up a bit and I thought I am going to do something about this in the public library that I work in. So I went to what we call library manager but you call a library director and I said I really want to set something up here, I really want to run a program and she said yep fine no problems, here's some money, here's some time and I got. I actually also got some money for my program from our friends at the library, I assume you all have a friends as well. Um, anyway, so I ran that program and that program was then nominated for a national award, which it received. Anyway, I was chugging along and then my husband sent me a link to a um, grant for, for our state. It was a very large grant for women only um, who had a topic of interest, which was a social sciences topic. Um, so he sent me the link and he said, you should apply for this and you know get research your area and and I and I said look I really think there's going to be a lot of really amazing people with fantastic ideas going for this grant for $25,000 for travel and he said to me he said yes yes you should give up before you put in an application <laughs> So at that point I said, all right. So I put in the application and I and I won. 
that grant, which was, I was amazed, which was fantastic. And then I was sort of busy getting everything together for that. And um, a grant came up in, um, in my state for the Public Libraries Association. And um, it, the grant was for innovation or something like that. And, um, and I was just busy doing my thing. And then I got a little tap on the shoulder that said, oh, we haven't actually received your application yet. And I went, oh, okay. So that means I need to put in an application. So I put in an application um, and I secured that funding as well. And then I thought, okay, I've got the state covered. I might as well go big time. I'm going national. So the uh, National Library Association had a grant at that time as well for, um, and it was actually for uh, services for um, to people with disability. So it was sort of quite apt. Anyway, I put in an application for that and I got that one as well. So with those three grants, I, um, I, I did this first part of the research and came over to the US and Canada. The reason I came over specifically to the US and Canada is one, you actually have a, high, a much higher population of people than we have. Um, and so uh, part of that was that there was actually more um, libraries that did have a focus in this area. So within Australia and New Zealand, there was, there was virtually nothing for me to go and research. Um, and of all the, I had done a lot of Googling beforehand and uh, talking to people and whenever I found an article where someone had written something on this, I would say, who else do you know is doing something in this? Can you kind of, you know, and so I'd follow that chain. So that's how I came up with the people I visited in um, the US and Canada. Um, since since getting those grants, I have actually won another two grants as well. One, one is um, what's called, what do they call it? An Australian postgraduate something, career, I don't know. Basically, it's the Commonwealth, our federal government have given me money to do my PhD. So they, you need to apply for that and to prove that you've got something worthwhile researching. And then I also um, received a grant to come here where I'd originally was going to go to the ALSC conference, but um, which is the American Libraries Association section, the children's section of that. And they have their two yearly conference. And um, so I was going to present at that, but that was canceled. So. Now I get to speak to all you wonderful people, which is great. Um, but I guess what I'm, what I was also trying to say by telling you about those grants is that that to me was a really clear indication of the level of interest in this topic, and I guess the lack of um, the the gap, that gap in knowledge where people were saying we don't know about this, we want to learn more. And it was at that point that I said, okay, I need to do my PhD in this topic. Okay, and this is a question that you can take away with you, but at the end of my presentation on that phase of study that I've done, I always say to people, what can your library do for Hannah and her family? So just mull that over in your head. Okay, um, and I will tell you another really quick, how am I going? Okay, I'm going okay, cool. Um, I was speaking with a wonderful librarian from New Zealand and he said to me that in his public library, which I'm pretty sure is the state, was the state reference or the state public library of New Zealand, he said what they do, um, and this kind of harks back to that question a little bit, he said whenever they make a change, whenever they bring in anything different within their library, they always ask themselves what would Andre do or how would Andre access this? And Andre is a little boy that they all know who has um, special needs who regularly comes to their library. And they said by having that on their um, list of assessment criteria, whenever they bring in anything different, helps them refocus, helps them have that in the forefront of their mind. And, and it, 
it can be the, the smallest things that you're bringing in, but sometimes you're not aware of the flow on effects that that has. So if you have that in your, um, in your planning sheets for when, in your, when you're bringing things in, it just make sure you bring that into focus in your mind. And I thought that was beautiful. And to me, it's also really great because I think it gives it a wonderful holistic focus as well. So you're looking at, um, at everything the library does, not just um, do we have a lift or do we have this. It's looking at it as a whole, which is what people are, aren't they? Okay. All right. So I'm only going to give you a really brief overview of this second phase and then I spend more time on the third phase because I love the third phase of my research. So the second phase is I spoke with... Um, public librarians in Australia and New Zealand who do not have a focus in this area. So these were public libraries who are just chugging along doing their thing, but they don't have a particular focus in this area. So these are just a really short, short little couple of things that I found out. What's really fascinating to me is that if less than 50% of the libraries um, were aware of the laws in this area, it's obvious it may not actually be a focus for their library. So if you don't know what your legal obligations are, how do you know you're meeting them? That seems um, sort of quite obvious to me. Um, and, oh, and the other thing which um, you can see in here, which I thought was also really fascinating, is that 20% of these public librarians considered library staff attitudes and sensitivity as a barrier. But as you can see, where have I got it? That was compared to 55% in that initial group who all have a focus in this area. So that's quite a big discrepancy there. And I think what it tells you, again, is that we're looking at people, uh, we're looking at public librarians who do not have a lot of knowledge in this area and do not have a lot of awareness. So. I hate to say this, but potentially they themselves <laughs> are, are being insensitive and so they're not aware of, of that. Okay. Um, and then, oh, partnerships one, it was just phenomenal as well. So, I, I mean, because they don't have a focus in this, not only 46% of them had done any partnerships with groups um, that deal with children with special needs compared to 94% for the original group. What that tells you is that the importance of partnerships, and I know I spoke about that before, but that's a really key thing as well. Um, and again, the lack of marketing, they just didn't do um, marketing. When I interviewed the families, and I gave you that little quote before, but what came out of all of my interviews as well is that <coughs> Many, many of the families were coming from a library model from their own childhood. So, and initially, I got initially caught with this when I was talking with one mum and she said, no, I don't take my child to the public library because of the noise. And I said, oh, yes, you know, public libraries can be really noisy places. I understand that that might be difficult for your child. And she said, no, I mean, my child is noisy. And I said, oh my gosh, bring them in. Don't be. <laughs> but what, she, what that mum was coming from was her, her childhood experience of the public library where you were not allowed to be noisy in there. Um, similarly, a lot of the families did not know what was available for them in the public library. And if we're not telling them, if we're not marketing, look, we've got audio books, we've got um, you know, DVDs, we've got we've got all these things. If they're not aware of that, then they're not going to come to us looking for it. Okay. All right, so let's go into the other one, which I love. So stage three or phase three of my research was talking with um, families of children with special needs. So just trying to find out what their experiences are, what their perspectives on um, this was. So the families that I spoke, no, eat, please eat. It's well, okay. Everything I'm touching, <laughs> Just well. crinkle. It's okay. I will talk louder. <laughs> um, 
so I spoke with 12 uh, families, self-selected families, and I spoke about this last night, but that in itself has some limitations that I needed to be aware of and to think about in terms of why were these families um, putting themselves forward? Was it because they loved libraries? Was it because they had problems they wanted to talk about? Just, just an awareness that they were um, self-selected families. And they also um, did an online survey and a one-on-one -on -one interview, which we, which we did together. So most of these took about two hours, um, but it was just, we had, we had a ball of the time, it was wonderful. Um, so this also gives you the spread of the age of the children, um, the bulk of them being in that in a six to 12 year um, range. There is no way of me at this point proving this, but my gut and my personal feeling is that I didn't have any families in the younger age group coming to me because they are still immersed in the medical system. They haven't actually got their head above that. And for those of you who've had children, you know, just having your first child, it can take sometimes a good year before you can confidently leave the house with all this stuff you need. So um, if you've got a child with special needs, that, that process is longer. Okay. So um, they, were fam they were asked, does your child with special needs enjoy visiting a library? 83% said yes and 17% said no. Again, I need to be aware that these were self-selecting families. Um, so it's hard, I can't say this is necessarily reflective of the whole community. Um, however, um, the quotes that I talk to you about give you a really good idea of what this whole experience is um, for them. All right, so again, they were asked what best describes your experience. 66% um, said welcome and 41 talked about how worried they would be with their child coping in that environment. Um, this statistic here beautifully also illustrates what I got out of all of my interviews, which was these were families that were passionate about the library. They loved the library. They desperately wanted their children to be literate. But when you pushed them a tiny bit more, they all spoke about problems they had in accessing the library and, and problems of inclusion. But they revered the library in, in, in the same way. Um, and what I got from them was a feeling that they didn't feel that they were in a position to ask for any more that then was being given to them, um, which made me a bit sad. <laughs> but um, but what it revealed to me is that if we can do that, we don't need them to ask us, we can just do that for them, um, that we're going to meet that need for them. Okay, now, oh, we didn't check. Have I got sound? We didn't check, I didn't check that. Well, let's have a go. Um, so what I wanted to do here was play a little quote for you. Um, these quotes are not the actual people speaking because of the confidentiality and ethics. Um, so it's some of my wonderful library colleagues who volunteered to do it for me. I apologise if you can't understand their Australian accents being recorded, but um, we'll give it a go. Are you able to navigate to that for me? Because I can't. I can't do that with my clicker. So this. Well, actually, I have. Yeah. yeah. That incident a couple of weeks ago. I went into the library, and the library has loads of after-school activities where you go and put your children's pants down. But you have to go in with the school pants on. So I went in and put my children's pants down. Yeah. 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 And I told her she could go with some friends. We'll go down to the library and we'll put your names down as soon as it's open because it books up really quick. So we go into the library and my son starts to have a meltdown. And so I said, you look after Tom and I'll quickly go and write your names down as quick as I can. But he wouldn't stop and was getting really distressed. And then the librarian came up to me and said in this really loud tone, you need to stop what you're doing and tend to your child. He needs you. 
and she walks off. I was so dumbfounded. And I thought, what, what is this all about? And then I felt really bad, like everyone in the library just wanted me out. I just felt so awful, like the worst mother. And another librarian saw what was happening and she said, I'll write the names down, let me do it for you. And I walked out and was really upset and he stopped. And I, I had no intention of staying, but then I had to. And then my daughter got upset because I was upset. It was a huge cue and everyone heard. And it was just hard enough for what was having to do with my son being like that. I mean, I, I know libraries are quiet and I respect that. And that day I was just going to go in, do what I had to do and leave. I was wondering if I was overreacting and maybe I should have just not been there. Children with autism can look like any other child and people don't understand that any minute that they can get anxious, overly anxious. And as a parent, it can be so difficult to handle that, especially when you've got another child and they're really excited to do something and then you have to pull them away and then they all resent it. But it was just, it was a tip of the iceberg, you know, when you've had that kind of day. That was just a tip and that was it. I felt like everyone wanted me out there, like every eye in place wanted me to leave. He was distressed, but I had no intention of, of staying. I was just going to do it really quick and leave. And uh, I find some, sometimes, not all, but some librarians can be so official and serious in that regard. You've got to give and take, and there are all sorts of walks of life coming in and out. Flexibility is a must, an absolute must. I'm sorry, how I answered your question. I'm so sorry. I just had to get that off my chest. I'm, I'm sorry. Beautiful, thank you. That was my lovely Tay at work. You can see how she got the emotion. <laughs> um, but it, I think it gives you a good example. And this was a mum who adores her public library. She loves it. Um, but, and she, what she wanted from me was for me to say to her, it's okay for you to be upset. She was asking me, is it okay for me to be upset to be treated like that? Okay. All right, so um, this gives you an indication of how often the families visited their public libraries that I interviewed. I have to, and I haven't done this yet because I haven't um, finished my analysis of it, but I do need to compare that to how often the general population, so that will give me a really nice indication of that. No one has those stats. <laughs> Okay, um, this is the sorts of things that the families did when they went into the library. And this one here is just wonderful as well. So um, I asked um, in the interview the families if they felt they were missing out on anything um, and what is just so fascinating, and they just about all did this, was they all say, no, I'm not missing out on anything. And then as they talk through the conversation, they're really missing out. So let's listen to this one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't think so. Yeah, I suppose we uh, don't do some of their programs and our activities. But we're not missing out because we don't do it. We don't do it because we never think of doing it. Because it's too hard with our kids. But we're not missing Sometimes out. Sometimes I see things and I think, oh gosh, my child would love that. And the other child will just be, I want to go home. But there are some things that I'm just like, oh, they would love it. But again, I probably still wouldn't go because you need so much um, more in-depth information about the activity because they can get bored. And it's not like a normal child um, that gets bored. You have issues. There'll be a tantrum and there'll be a meltdown. And it's more than them getting bored. It's having to deal with that. 
Thank you. Um, so you can see really clearly there how she said, no, no, we're not missing out because we don't go. Well, that means you are missing out. She don't go because. The other thing which was really interesting about this is that she explains they don't go because she doesn't have the level of information she needs about that activity to be able to work out how it's going to work for her child. So again, that's sort of some of those programming ideas. Sometimes we assume that people will know what our activity will involve, but maybe we can have a much more descriptive um, blurb about it for people. Okay. Um, how would you rate access to public libraries? Um, what this tells you is that only 24% actually rate it as good. So 74% find it okay to poor, to very poor. I did have a very poor one as well. So that was a Likert scale that people could take. Um, yet, they all love coming to the library. If you remember that very first statistic was something like 80 something percent. But they, they somehow don't feel entitled to ask for more. How well do the programs suit your child? Again, only 16% were able to give a good rating. Um, and what were the barriers? So we talked about, they talked about programs and then other visitor reactions. Um, and it's, for me, when we talk about other visitor reactions, I know some people think sometimes maybe they should be putting in place um, community awareness programs. I don't necessarily think that's going to be effective. I think the only people who come to those are people who are already community minded. <laughs> um, what has worked in my library, and actually I think I was talking with Julie about this the other night, um, was that it's the role modelling that the librarians and, and staff play. So if you accept and make everybody feel welcome, you're role modelling that. And I guess a really classy example in my own library is we have um, a lovely lady um, who comes to our library and she actually, I was saying she followed one of our librarians from another library. She now has to catch something like two or three buses to come to our library. She walks in the door and first question is, what team do you go for? And if you don't go for her team straight away, you're a loser. And she shouts that right across the library, loser! <laughs> And our, or if, if she sees you um, doing something, she'll, be, she'll shout at you, you're not doing any work again today. And, you know, she's very loud, um, very, very in your face in a way, very there. The um, community that I work in is a reasonably higher socioeconomic area. So when she first started coming to our libraries, we were getting a lot of looks, a lot of questions, a lot of people coming up afterwards, you know, Da, da, da. We we said to the you know we spoke with them. We said, look, you know, Rachel's fine. Br bring her in. She's great. We role modelled. We all talk with her. It's not a problem now. She's been coming for years, probably probably six years or more now. It's not an issue anymore. So, um, I think in terms of visitor reactions, it really is a little bit like if we don't react, then the community are okay with it. And anybody who's done inclusive education and has worked in a classroom knows that's the same as well. If the if the teacher accepts and role models how that child is to be accepted within the class, everybody else goes along with it. Okay, and this is my last slide to tell you where you can find out some more information um, or email me if you want to. But Nobody has asked a question, so <laughs> now you have to ask a question. And I would say ask questions, share experiences. Yes. Um, I know we have some people from the public library here, so you probably have success stories to share too. But so let's just have a conversation. Well, uh, go with Narcissa and then to you, Tammy. Uh, hi. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. 
Um, so my question is, when you ask the parents about the programs at the library, um, were you asking them about the programs that were already there and they feel welcome to those programs? Okay. Yeah. And then, did you find that the libraries um, that were looking for funding to have more things accessible to um, children uh, that are disabled, did they already have uh, programs that are geared towards disabled children? No, so the libraries that I spoke with in Australia, they the majority do not have a focus in this area at all. The majority, they do nothing at this oh. point. Then um, a lot of it is awareness. Oh. They're not really aware of, I think to some degree, they're not necessarily, they know, they know they have children within their groups that have special needs, but they're just not quite sure how to deal with it at this point. So. Um, you would probably have the same here where we have um, a, we have statewide children's library uh, so group and we meet quarterly and um, and quite often people will talk to each other in that group oh my gosh how am I going to deal with this but it's not at this point dealt with um, at a at a statewide level and we don't have education programs and awareness programs for people to tap into like that at the moment. Helen? Did that answer your question? Yeah, a little. I'll just you can have somebody ask in the right. question first. Okay. I'm Kelly Crab, but I work here in town. I'm a youth services librarian at one of the Greensboro Public Libraries. Beautiful. And I, I do have some programs for kids with autism, and I'm also a parent of a child yeah. with autism. So I just wanted, it's more of a comment than a question, that I'm so appreciative of the emphasis you're putting on families. Because I find so much of the literature is about how to create programs that are accessible for the children, and yeah. that's incredibly important. But, but understanding that incredibly high level of anxiety that the parents yes. carry, coming into the library building. And when you talk about staff training, I think it would be just as important for the staff to bend over backwards to realize you're dealing with a parent whose so anxiety is through the roof just yes. stepping into the door. Yes. So I just wanted to thank you for oh, your focus on that. Oh, you're welcome. And um, and I think, you know, that was, was one of the key things that came out of a lot of this as well when I spoke with the families. But for me, it's been phenomenal because I've presented this at a number of um, reasonably large conferences within Australia and every single time I've presented, um, I've had a librarian come up to me afterwards and say, I've never taken my child with special needs to a public library because it's too hard and I am terrified to do it. And again, this is where I, th where I go back to when I was, um, when my child was younger and had really significant needs, how hard it was for me. And I thought, oh my gosh, if it's so hard for me and I'm an early intervention person, I'm a librarian, I'm a teacher, this should be the most comfortable environment for me. If I can't deal with it, how on earth are other people? Yeah, and, it, and, and just, it amazes me. Every single time I will have one or two people come up and say, I have never taken my child into a library and they're 18. Yes. I was wondering if you can introduce yourselves. Oh, right. My name is Sarah Mayhew. I'm a student. Um, uh, I was wondering if you had like a specific source that you used in order to come up with or like get ideas for programs with for special needs? See, I would love that that exists. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Phase four of the next. Yeah. What, what I did, and you will laugh at this, when I, um, like I said, I, went, I started at the public library and I went, right, I'm just going to, first of all, I'll wait for a little bit to make sure they get to know me and, and hopefully like me a little bit. I won't strike them straight away. So I sort of... <laughs> waited for maybe six months or I think I waited until I had permanency that probably was the key I thought right now they can't sack me um and and so anyway when I got the okay I thought 
great, no problem. I'll just Google how to run, <laughs> how to run a story time for children with special needs. Blah, blah, blah. Nothing. Okay. Put in a whole range of different terms. It was incredibly, incredibly hard to find anything at all. And at that point, I thought, right, well, I'm not going to give this background and I'm just not giving up. So then I, um, and this is where partnership, partnerships makes a phenomenal difference. I rang up our um, disability services in our area and I said, I really want to run this program. I've got no idea really how to do it. Can you help me? And they said, you know what? Part of our um, mission at this point is outreach and community programs. And I went, great. And they said, excellent, we're coming around. And they gave me a um, speech pathologist for a term and we worked together and developed something. Now, I'm not going to pretend everybody's going to get that. <laughs> but um, you might be surprised um, when you reach out to the organisations in your area what they are prepared to partner with you on and that's how you learn and that's how you make connections with the families and the children and it, and it's it is also really important to remember that each child like like everybody is different so just because and you would know just because somebody is diagnosed with having autism doesn't mean they all fit this same category. So that's why for myself, when I run my programs, I just call them special needs programs because quite often what works for one child with a particular special need, another child with a completely different diagnosis may have the same difficulties and that might work for them. But I think what I'm trying to do, and which is what you're getting at, is I'm just trying to make those parents feel great because if the parents feel great, the parents relax and then that helps the kids. Um, and I didn't mention it here, but another really, really big thing for me in doing this is parents to have those fun, non-therapy experiences with their children because most of their days are caught up with trying to help their child speak, trying to help their child eat, trying to help them. And all of the interactions that parent has with their child is like a therapy teaching interaction. I want them to have fun and I don't want that child to come and think they have to perform in that therapy way. I'm happy if they just sit there the whole time and just absorb, fine, that's what, do you know what I mean? So this is what the library can provide which no other um, early into you know those services they can't they can't provide it at that same level because they're at the bottom of it they're all still trying to provide therapy we're not trying to do that and it's free and it's free okay. and they get to meet other people within their community who may not who families that may not have the same special need but it doesn't matter because sometimes you know the issues are still there you still yeah yeah Chase, is anybody online that has a question? Don't ask, tell them they're free to ask questions if they want to. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments. Mm -hmm. you know, Introduce yourself, sir. My name is Alex I'm one of the faculty members of the program. And Ben, you asked a question about the two libraries. You know, what are the barriers? And in the US, there is about 50% of the students. Yes. And in Australia and New Zealand, it's about 22%. Uh, yes. And my question is, when you asked that question to librarians, were they uh, evaluating or looking at their own colleagues within the same library? They answered that question to kind of general speaking. Um, it was a little bit of both, um, but that's a really interesting question. Um, they they predominantly spoke about their own library because it's very hard for them to make an assessment of someone else's library, but. Um, there was a little bit of generalisation in that as well, but yeah. The reason I ask because when in, in the case of Australia and New Zealand, you know, although they weren't aware of the woes, but also they said attitude of their colleagues wasn't a problem. As you said, you know, they don't know how they were meeting the goals. Yeah. At the same time, they are not creating attitude is not a problem. Yeah. Maybe it never came up. But how would you? So. Yeah. I mean, in the case of US and. 
sometimes you may treat them as no, no. Because when you spoke to them, probably you might have gotten better intuition. And they may have thought that they are not good enough. Maybe. I don't know. I think you're right. I think you've got a really valid point there. Um, because the US libraries that I spoke with were libraries that have a focus in this area. So they already, I guess, know where the bar can be. That's what you're referring mm -hmm. to? Yeah. So they know where they can be reaching. And so they're really aware of how far they've got to go to that bar. The Australian and New Zealand libraries that I spoke with do not have a focus in this, this area, so they don't know where that bar is. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and I think I think that's actually the key to it. I think, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I'd like you to say a little bit more about this important of partnerships with other organizations in the community, because it was something that, that I found also in my study of library services for older adults, um, yes. public librarians um, that I was studying tended to be pretty much oblivious to the fact that there's lots of other agencies in the community that are also serving older adults, and so it's kind of just this, this silo effect where yes. it's just kind of been so could you say a little bit more about, about developing those partnerships and, and the importance of them for services in this area? Um, Joe, Joe, that's Noah Lindstrom. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're introducing people so that people online can tell, but Joe would like to know who you are. Too. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, there is one really amazing example. Um, it was fascinating. I went to, this was a public library in Australia and I went and visited them. And, um, and we were talking about what they do and what they don't do and things like that. And she said, she said, you know, it's a little bit, she said, we're obviously not quite doing enough or we're not switched on enough because the district that she is in had the head offices for two or three of the major organisations that um, provide services for children with special needs in the state. So she had the head offices stones throw away. She had never thought to partner with them. She had a major hospital a stones throw away. She had never thought to partner with them. And then perhaps adding insult to injury in their area, they had just received um, the collection of um, resources for people with disabilities, the statewide collection. So we we used to, in our state, we had a resource centre for um, people with disabilities and they closed that down. Let's not go there. They closed that down and then, so then they just said, look, would any public library like these resources? So this particular public library said, oh, okay, we'll have them. So they took them. They forgot to tell anybody else they actually had these resources. So none of the other public libraries knew they had them. They didn't tell any of these big organisations that run programs for children with special needs that they had these resources. So the resources were simply sitting on the shelf and nobody knew that they were there. If they partnered, if they'd reached out to those groups, they would have been able to, and she was, and while we were talking through this, she was like, oh my gosh, I really need to do this. And I said, yeah, probably would be great if you've got time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they could have created flyers that they took to those um, organisations and asked those organisations to give it to their families to say, you know, oh, are you interested in, um, topic these topics did you know that the public library just around the corner has got all of these books that sort of thing um so it there's a lot of different ways that you can partner with organizations to do that i know um in chicago there's um actually chicago have a fantastic network i should tell you about this it's called the acronym is SNAILS, which stands for Special Needs and Inclusive Library Services. That could be about right, couldn't it? Anyway, the acronym is SNAILS. 
It is an online um, network of 42 public libraries in the greater Chicago area who get together to support each other in developing a more inclusive um, library and more inclusive programs. They meet, I think, once or twice a year. Last time I was here, I was really, really fortunate to actually um, be just when one of their meetings was um, held, which was great. So, I mean, obviously they've provided that network for themselves and there's no reason why anybody else, you know, other public libraries can't do that as well. So that's that real sharing and when you're talking about the programs, that's where they say, oh, I tried out this program, it did or it didn't work. This went well, this didn't went well, go well. Next time I do this or whatever. Um, so they share a lot of resources with each other. But um, what I was coming back to was this one library and they have a partnership with, they've got a special needs school in their district. And I think you, do you have districts as well. You call them district number, blah, blah, blah. Do you number? Yeah. yeah, and you give them numbers or something or other. I feel no, like that's Chicago. That's Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always felt like it was kind of in an episode of um, Hunger Games or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's in that, like, county systems. Oh, okay. All right. It's a little bit more personal, a bit more personal. Anyway, so. They have this special needs school and they partner with them and they develop term by term programs and part the one that they were doing most recently which is just brilliant is a social skills um, program and so each child um, has is given a question and they have to come into the library and practice asking a public librarian the question um, and I mean, obviously there's a lot more involved in it, but so I guess what I'm trying to illustrate is that when you're doing that partnering, there are opportunities for doing things like that because that's a really safe environment for those children, well, hopefully really safe environment for those children to start practicing some of those crucial social skills that they need. Um, in. Did that help you at all? Did that answer your question a bit? Yeah, yeah. I think um, we might wrap it up because some people might be needing to go someplace else and I know people will want to talk to Joe afterwards, but thank you all for coming today. Thank uh, you. Joe, it was excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord Caroline, for running the uh, soundboard. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> for, uh, for attending today. Uh, thanks, I think you can turn the cameras off and uh, thanks everybody again for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Oh, good. Thank you. 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 Thank you